Good evening, everyone. Um, in our, our Zen Center is part of an international school called the Quantum School of Zen. You've already heard during the introduction about Quan Se Um Bosal. Quan Se Um means hearing the cries of the world. Quan Um, you could say hear sound, or the way we actually translate it would be perceive sound. So we have the perceived sound school of Zen. But that brings us right back to this idea of hearing the cries of the world. When it, of course, we're listening to everything, but our intention is to listen to this world and to hear those cries. So this talk tonight is a little bit about that. Um, in our, we have Zen centers, there's probably about a hundred Zen centers scattered in cities and towns all across the world. We have Zen centers in North America, we have some in Mexico, I think we have one in Argentina, and perhaps even Brazil still, many in Europe, in Australia, in the Middle East, and of course in Asia. So we're scattered in many different places. And um, <coughs> every three years, we hold a conference, an international conference, which we call the whole world is a single flower. And um, those of you who come all the time, you've heard me talk about this before, but I want to say a few words about this phrase, the whole world is a single flower. If you just turn your heads backwards and look from my direction on the right of those three teachers on the back wall, on the right is Zen Master Mangal. He was a Zen master in Korea from probably the somewhere in the early 1900s, uh, yeah, in the early 1900s until I think he died in the in the late 40s, and. Um, much of the time he was teaching in Korea, Korea was occupied by the Japanese. And it was a very difficult occupation. The Japanese were fairly heavy handed in the way they approached their desire to change Korean culture. And one of the places they tried to change Korean culture was they tried to change Korean Zen to match the tradition that they had in Japan. Zen Master Mangan was one of a, a number of, of Buddhist leaders and Zen Masters in Korea who resisted. At one point, the legend goes, resisted um, at the, uh, how do we say, at the end of the barrel of a gun. It was this, the, the Japanese wanted the Korean monastics to marry just like they did in Japan. In Japan in the late 1800s, the monastics were forced to abandon celibacy and to marry in order to lessen the power of the monastic tradition and give more power to the governmental powers that be in Japan. And they tried to do that same thing in Korea. So Zen, it was a tough time that Zen Master Mangan was teaching. And the, the story goes that when his attendant or someone came into his room to tell him that the Japanese had surrendered in World War II, which of course meant the Japanese would be leaving Korea, he took the national flower of Korea, which he had on his desk, which is a Sharon rose. I believe it's the blossom end of the rose, although I could be mistaken, it could be the stem, and I don't have the the calligraphy with me right up here, but the story goes that he penned this calligraphy, the whole world is a single flower. That was his response to the change. Interestingly, it wasn't an angry calligraphy. It wasn't a making separation calligraphy. It was the recognition that the whole world is one flower. And, um, it's important when we think of that phrase, the whole world is a single flower. When I hear it, my initial hearing is this whole world, and really we can say this whole universe, is one thing. It's one flower. But you can also turn that 
image around and each thing in this world is, is the whole. In traditional Buddhist teaching we say the many is the one, the one is the many. You probably, we've all heard the word Dharmadhatu, it's a word in the Tibetan tradition, it's, it's something that we, we hear about, but the Dharmadhatu teaching is essentially the one is the many, the many is the one. So everything together makes this whole world, and each thing in this world is the whole world. We're all the same, we all manifest differently, but we're all made of the same substance. Everything's made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. All matter that we know of is made of that. The only thing that changes is how many of them are included in each thing, in each physical thing, but we're all made of the same substance, everything. So we hold these conferences every three years, and in 2008, we held the conference in Warsaw, Poland. And uh, we have actually in Warsaw, Poland is the head temple of our European tradition. Back in the late 70s, our teacher Zen Master Sung San got invited to come to Poland to teach Buddhism. Nobody really understood why this communist country would be inviting this Zen Master from South Korea to come to uh, Poland. The, the theory that I think people now hold is that the government was concerned about the power of the Catholic Church. And they thought if they could encourage Buddhist practice, it might limit some of the power that the Catholic Church had. Anyway, so we have a fairly large school in Poland. Um, and as part of this trip to Poland, we took a trip, all probably close to 150 of us, we went to Auschwitz, and um, we took a, I guess, we, I guess it was about a four hour, very comprehensive and very, very heavy tour of Auschwitz. Now, I grew up Jewish American, and in the generation that I grew up in, the story of the Holocaust was actually not talked about too much. My theory about it is the community was traumatized and they didn't know how to talk about it. And really I knew about it, but I didn't know much about it until I was in high school and I read, I think it's a novel, QB7, which informed me and then I continued to be informed. And so we were a group made up of people from the United States, people from Western Europe, people from Eastern Europe, and people from three or four different countries in Asia. And um, we had a film crew from Korean Buddhist television with us. And as soon as we walked out, I happened to be with a, a Korean nun at the moment that we walked out of the gates, totally blown away by what we've seen. And this Korean nun actually lived in the United States, so she was, she had been, I don't know how long she'd been here, but she spoke English and uh, at least had some of the trappings of, of being a Westerner. Um, and these, the TV station, they shoved this camera first into her face and they said, how could this happen? She was so blown away, she said, leave me alone, and she walked away. And then they shoved that camera in my face, and they said, how could this happen? And I said something to the effect of the affliction of human mind. Our minds are so complex, our consciousness is so complex, and we get so lost in that complexity that it's so easy for crazy behavior to become normal. And when things happen long enough, we just get used to it. I just happened to read this week, or last week, that in Germany they made a film 
about the, the, the story of the film is, um, had been one of the, the name probably will be expressive enough, but Gerbil's secretary, who was about 101 years old, and they interviewed her. And the film is basically about this interview. And she said one thing that was really interesting. She says, nowadays people say, had I known, I would have done something. She said, they're lying. They think they would have done something. But she said, we were all living in a concentration camp too. And nobody would have done it. Not nobody. Of course, some people did. There was resistance. There was, it's, it's nothing is all or nothing. But common people follow along. We get used to things. We get acculturated to it. And our minds have this capacity to make right what, once we see things differently, we realize aren't right. That's our human mind. And remember, that's what Zen practice is about. Not only Zen practice, any Buddhist practice is about dealing with this mental affliction of not being able to see clearly, being swept up in circumstance, and getting lost in it. So, now let's flash forward to the last week here in the United States. We had two African American men shot at very close range on video, so we all get to see it. And yeah, in the last year, there's the Black Lives Matter movement that has made noise. So we've got dissonance in our culture because we've accepted this as just the way it is for a very long time. And now we have video. Now we have a way to see the result of our own unconsciousness, of our own mental afflictions. And we're all stirred up. We don't know what to do about it. We're confused, really. But we're getting to see the truth. The truth isn't pretty. I don't know anybody who likes the truth that we're seeing. But we have to be so careful about that tendency to make things okay. To, and each of us has our own way of doing this. We see it, we see it in other people and we can comment on it. But the hardest place to see it is in ourselves. And that is the starting point of our practice. Our practice is about observing. When Karen was giving meditation instruction tonight, she said, we ask the question, what am I? That's the fundamental beginning point, middle point, and ending point of our practice. If we can raise the question, without trying to answer it. Karen said there's one answer, don't know. That don't know just helps us reinforce our not knowing and our openness. Usually our style of mind is to answer the question quickly so we can relax. We're always looking to settle back down. So if I can come up with an answer, then I can relax. But Zen practice isn't about relaxing. It's about being able to be with the discomfort, to be with not knowing, to be with uncertainty. So we're often talking about observing rather than thinking. When we ask this question, what am I? Because we're so focused in our thinking mind, we start thinking, well, maybe I can figure it out. You know, we learn starting in school from probably these days, pre-kindergarten. Pre we're taught to think things through and figure them out. 
And there's a great value to that. A lot of as amazing things human beings have discovered through the power of rational thought. But rational thought also leaves us ignorant of certain things that we can't figure out. We can only know them through observation and our own experience. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. I wanted to just say a few words about when we think about our own lives, we can see that the past is a precursor to the present. We, we develop our tendencies, our beliefs, our ideas, our experiences build on each other. And what really, one of the important points of suffering in the human life is getting lost in this mountain of experience and thinking that's who we are. And then each new thing gets filtered through what's happened before. And so each new thing becomes a confirmation of what we've experienced before. I think social scientists call it confirmation bias. So we see things based on our own perspective. And we skew, we continually skew our reality based on what we've understood in the past. And again, to bring it back to practice, our practice is to open that up, to burst that bubble of confirmation bias, and to be able to see things clearly. When the Buddha taught the Eightfold Path, the first fold of the Eightfold Path is right view. We often teach right view, that right view means no view. Another way of saying that is right view means seeing things as they are. That sounds easy, but it's actually almost impossible because our brains and our consciousness are wired in such a way that our past experience colors what we see. It's my sense, having practiced for a while, that, that in using our Zen practice, or really any Buddhist practice, specifically the, the teachings of meditation, because meditation isn't about thought. Sometimes we say, in our tradition, we say, don't explain it, show it. Don't think it. See it, feel it, observe it. So we use this not knowing to help us break out of our confirmation bias, to see things more clearly. And it ain't easy. With it, in a moment's loss of our awareness, we go back to believing things that we believed before. So practice, this observational practice, isn't a one-time thing, or a two-time thing, or even a thousand-time thing. It's a moment-to-moment -moment experience. We train in this Dharma room so that we can bring that awareness into our everyday life. If we're only using our practice in here, in some ways we're wasting our time. Because even if you sat in this room for two hours a day, you'd have 22 other hours. That unless you're bringing your practice into that everyday life, you're really not doing it. And none of us do it all the time. But again, Karen said in the, said in the meditation and instruction, just bring your mind back. You drift away, you come back. And in our everyday life, what we're coming back to is observation. What is this? Not only what am I, but what is this? And it's not about thinking, it's about observing. I was just working with someone today in, 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 in therapy, and we were talking exactly about this subject. She was talking about her difficulties, and it doesn't even matter what those difficulties are. 
But what I was encouraging her to do is observe in her life when this happens. First off, we have to notice that it's happening. And then we have to notice what's our experience of it? What does it feel like in our bodies? What, what surrounds the experience? If we're observing and we're only focused right here, we're missing everything out there. So it's a soft focus. It's not, it's not zeroed in on one thing, but it's observing everything. What is going on moment to moment? And just as a, an individual has to do this, actually a culture has to do this. The culture itself, which of course is made up of the many individuals, has to learn to observe, to be willing to bear witness to what it is that's actually going on. Because the culture itself, it's pushed by what's happened before. And our beliefs and ideas are based on the cultural values that get pushed. And of course, in any culture, and I think all of us can experience it in our own, there's a dissonance, there's always a competition. There are many different strands happening all at once. And again, depending on our bias, we focus on one versus the other. And it's quite a challenge to keep an open enough mind to allow for more than one or more than the ones that I like to be listened to. So this image of Kwan Sein Bosal hearing the cries of the world, we need that openness. We need that empathy, really, to believe somebody else's experience to say, well, that may not be mine, but I should listen. So, I can't remember his name, but the, the second man that was shot, the one in, in Minnesota, it's come out, and I've heard a few different numbers, but in the last, and I'm not going to get these numbers exactly right, so don't lock into these specific numbers, but in the last five years or so, he had been stopped by the police anywhere from one time I heard 56 times and one time I heard 30 some odd times. For things like, I mean, this traffic stop was for a broken taillight. I've been stopped in those same six years. I've been stopped once. And there was a good reason I was stopped. I made a U-turn very clearly in a place where I was not allowed to make a U-turn. But when the cop came to my window, he was quite nice. And while he was looking up my information, and I would imagine getting ready to give me a ticket, he must have gotten a call on his radio to something more important. So he came back and gave me my license. He said, goodbye, don't do that again. And he was off. That's privilege. That's privilege. First of all, I have enough money not to have a broken tail light. That's privilege. But unless I open my mind, I think everybody has the same experience I have. And most of my friends and family are white. And they share the same experience I have. So of course that's what happens. So we need to stay open. Our practice is to hear the cries of the world. Kwan Sein Bosal does two things. I think I said it during when I was explaining our chanting. One is to listen. But this image on the wall here, you can't actually you can't see any arms of Kwan Sein Bosal. But many of the images in Asia, Kwan Sein Bosal has a thousand arms. And each arm has an eye. Each hand has an eye in its palm. So, and what that does, it allow, maybe we should say it has an ear, because it allows each hand to see 
or to hear and then respond. So, in many ways we can say our Zen practice is about being Kuan Sen Bosa, being Kuan Yin. We sometimes say, follow the Bodhisattva way. The Bodhisattva way is to help all beings. Our teacher used to say, attain your true self, or sometimes we can say, understand, observe, and know what am I, and then act from that place to help. So we all have these hands. What do we do with them? That's our job as human beings. Certainly, it's our job as practitioners who are dedicated to attaining the way, to breaking through the veil of ignorance and unconscious behavior, to, to hone that ability to listen, to see, to hear clearly, to smell clearly, to taste clearly. We say in our practice, this cuts off all thinking. When we cut off all thinking, everything is truth. Because it's not biased by my particular idea. These particular ideas, feelings, beliefs are so subtle, we have to learn how to observe, to wonder. We have this teaching of great doubt. Great doubt is this not knowing mind. We use curiosity and wonder <coughs> as our entry point into the world. It's a very uncomfortable place, actually. So when we give meditation instruction, we're always talking about bringing your awareness to your lower abdomen. And I'd like to offer this, especially to those of you who practice in other traditions. I don't think one meditation style is any better than any other. And to me, it's, it's like, it's impossible. So in Vipassana style meditation, you sit with your eyes closed. In Zen meditation, you sit with your eyes partially open. To me, it's impossible that one of those is right. It doesn't matter. What really matters is that you do it. But in our practice, we orient our energy and our attention to our lower abdomen, because that's a place of stability. You could just imagine, if our, if our energy is too much in our thinking mind, we're just lost in our thinking. If our energy is too much in our heart center, we're lost in our feelings. And our feelings and thoughts are constantly biasing our perceptions. But if we can bring our attention to, your low, to our lower abdomen, in Japan they call it the hara, or the center. In Korea and China they call it the tanjen, energy garden. So we bring our awareness down into this energy garden, and we get stability. My teacher used to poke us right here with a stick. And he'd say, make your center stronger, stronger, stronger. He didn't mean rigid. He didn't mean tight. He meant strong in a way of flexible, resilient, and open. The other thing we have in this Chinese teaching I was just talking about great doubt, we have great courage. And in China they say there's three things you need to practice Zen. It's great doubt, great courage, and great faith. Great courage is in the middle. It takes courage to observe our own stupidity. It takes courage to change. It takes courage to be willing to acknowledge that we were wrong. Without courage, we stay locked in the past. With courage, we can stay open 
if our center is strong, we're more able to be vulnerable, to acknowledge our own not knowing. And in that acknowledgement, we connect rather than separate. And if anything is going to change, we have to connect rather than separate, rather than turn away and think of all the reasons why we're right and the other is wrong. We have to be curious and we have to wonder. So I just want to finish with one last thing. I just happened to, you know, I really look at my phone way too much. I'm not much different than probably everybody else in this room. I happen to follow news. I happen to like to, and one of the things I enjoy about Facebook is that people put things up that I would never see. And I think what I'm about to say was on one of the news sites that I looked at. But there was a speech at the, in the U.S. Senate today, and it was given by one of the senators from South Carolina. And this senator happens to be a, Republic, a black Republican senator, a very conservative senator. And he, got, he made a speech and he said, I've been stopped in my car seven times this year. And he said, apparently every senator is given a pin and they put it in their lapel and that gives them access to the, the I guess, the private sections of the Capitol. So he walks into the Senate building, they see his pin and they say, go ahead. And and at least in one particular day, the cop stopped him and said, I recognize the pin, but I don't recognize you. And he made him show his ID. And he said, it wasn't so terrible. About a few hours later, he got a call from the supervisor of the cop who apologized for this. He said, now again, I might not get this number right. He said, I've been called by a supervisor of a cop in the Capitol five times this year to apologize for the behavior. This is a conservative con senator from South Carolina. We need to listen. It doesn't happen to the white senators. They don't have this problem. And when told about it, our first tendency, if it's not our experience, is to deny it or explain it away. That's, we can respond to that by being judgmental and critical of ourselves and beating ourselves up for it. That's not helpful. That just puts us more entrenched and more separate. We can respond to it with surprise, with wonder, with curiosity with the heart and the mind of Kwan Seng Boso. And if we do that, maybe, no guarantees, but maybe things can change. There's a million ways probably to create change. And each of us has our own propensity. So on some level, I would just encourage everybody to do whatever moves you. But do it with love, compassion, and wisdom. One of the favorite clips I ever heard on KPFA was they were playing this, um, I don't know why they were doing it, they were playing uh, like the, set, the audio of a peace demonstration. And suddenly you hear in this really loud voice this guy screaming, Fuck you! Fuck you! We want peace! Fuck you! <laughs> Sounds stupid, but I've been in those demonstrations. I know what that feeling's like. I don't scream that loud, but I know that feeling. We have to wake up. The word Buddha means awake. Our job as practitioners is to wake up. That's true in our personal life. It's true in our social life. It's true in our political life. It's true in all ways. So I just want to encourage each of us in our own way to use this practice to awaken, to expand and open 
rather than contract, make smaller, and make separate.